Well, I hope it's going to be uh, an ecliptic time tonight, uh, considering the impact that such cosmological um, events have on our minds, it's quite likely that uh, today's lecture will have a particular impact um, on the way we understand and think about architecture. Now, good evening and welcome to SciArc's uh, public Wednesday evening lecture. Uh, tonight, we're welcoming Neil Spiller. And who is Neil Spiller? Would not be phrasing uh, the question quite rightly. If you don't know, you simply are not aware and not part of the many circles of thinkers that are contributing to the current practice and discourse outlining contemporary questions in architecture. So the question is not who Neil is, but rather what project is Neil working on at this very moment in time? What are the current questions and investigations he got on his table and on his mind? And how does he transpose them into actual architectural potentialities? And it is not the limit of our imagination we need to question or stretch, nor do we need more seductive mirrored images of our imagination. We got our own factory here, LA and SciArc. We're right in the midst of it. We are well past the initial digital revolutions and stay fairly unimpressed, not blasé, with more innovation. The question has shifted to how we go about investigating the depth and the consequences of our proposed systems beyond initial visually impressive anchor points and uh, probabilities and potentials of our futures. What are the cultural and political consequences resuming architecture's mission of world making or referring to one of his own reference and father figures, Peter Cook's and um, Archigram, that obviously had a very deep sort of cultural was also political sort of embedding of their idea. Our current libraries of knowledge are vast, free and near open-ended sources of avail availability for accessing data and information of new technologies across the many fields of new science research. Nanotechnology, biotech, artificial intelligence, and the many more. Our time asks for more than technological inventiveness and ideas and funky forms reflecting mere decadence of perpetual repetitiveness of the image of the new but oblige us to investigate the grounds for the new to grow upon. What is the turf, the larger image of that new? How does it reside within a relevant contributor to the advancement of mankind and its survival? Form and science fiction imaginary have exhausted and saturated our visual curiosity and visual vocabulary and require an investigation of rethinking matter in relation to changing question mark existential needs. In those terms, it is less the exuberance of architecture design form, which we take for granted by a visionary like Neil. Uh, it's the implications of ideas that interest us to build new architecture upon oscillating realities of cross-firing minds and material space. Our time is searching for the instruments to locate the intelligence of ideas within the course of technological cultural development and identity the ground and spaces to exist and unfold new emergent and encompassing ecologies, synthetic and biological. On the new bioturf as playouts for philosophical, cultural and political realities, Neil operates in that niche. He wants architecture to work conjunct with the discoveries in science and technology, ideas for serious fut futurists and question mark unconditionally upon the new potentials of technology. The spatial propositions he envisions are about cyberspace, molecular and tissue engineering, genetics and emergent technologies and the many more we're here tonight. Projecting drastic changes to our environment and spatial horizon. According to Spiller, we literally live in the past, but advancement not only pushes for new space and spatial and political organization, it also asks for our history books to be rewritten, 
the principles upon today's architecture is built on have become totally redundant. Current knowledge hardly sails with modern society. Concurrent architectural traditions production is totally inefficient and even unnecessary. Although we live in a fluid and dynamic world, it still yet has to find its equivalent in political, cultural and structural and structures and biological equilibrium. Besides scripting software, designing cybernetic processes, new science such as genetic engineering, artificial intelligence, cloning and so forth, they are the future of architecture. Of course, innovation is the key. It's somewhat what should be fundamental to architecture. Now, there are profound technological paradigms at work here, and it points towards the question back at Britain's history, framed by Isaac Newton's natural science history, setting the path for industrial revolutions, preceding the opening of social conditions of pre-revolutionary England, of empiricists like Francis Bacon. The fascination lies in technology, not theory, always referring to Britain, responsible to ignite revolutions and the minds of perpetual inventors transgressing failures of the mechanistic paradigms. What are the learnings of propagating the new technologies out of that old world? What is it made out of? And where does it take us, Neil? Neil Space is uh, at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Uh, he is course director, holds a number of um, administrative positions, he is uh, the course director of the MR program, he's a director of AVATAR, which is the Advanced Virtual and Technological Architecture Research Group. Do look it up on, uh, on the web if you haven't looked it up. AVATAR uh, is a very interesting um, master program uh, at the Bartlett. He is author of a number of books, to name a few, Digital Dreams, Architecture and the New, uh, Alchemic Technologies, He's a co-editor of Young Blood, the AD uh, magazine, 2001. Um, the Power of Contemporary Architecture, a collaboration with Peter Cook, and Paradox of Contemporary Architecture. Now, Spiller is an international critic and lecturer. So wel let's welcome him. Sayark welcomes Neil Spiller, and Los Angeles welcomes London. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Jean-Michel. Um, that was the best uh, introduction I've ever had, and I hope I live, live, uh, live up to it. So thank you for spending the time to think about it. I appreciate it. I'd just like to quote someone to begin with. Well, I believe there's poetry in the soul of every man. In F-111 fighters and Roberto Duran, there's poetry on the air, babe, sliding across the sky. Surfs right down on a radio wave and into my hi-fi. I believe there's poetry locked right up inside my skin. Tigers caged in the quantum zone and I can hear them sing. Poetry's under pressure, sealed in an aerosol can. Splattered all around the ghetto wall and skip, oh, mark I am. Poetry dances on TV, slides in the VCR. Poetry's made in Scotland and they sell it behind the bar. Um, that was a quote, that wasn't me, I wish I'd written it, um, it's uh, from my favourite English philosopher, this man, Zodiac Mind Warp, <laughs> the self-styled tattooed beat messiah. Now, I'm going to tell you about um, a 10 year research project that I've been working on, for, obviously for the last 10 years, called Communicating Vessels. Uh, the project has 66 subtitles. I would have liked it to have 666, but um, it's a bit of a schlep to get there. Rude mechanicals, critical paths, EI, EIO. Swerving, Slamhoundian surrealism, Uapo. Shake that bush again. Bees, beekeeping, and Benini's bush. Dirty ankles are examples. The boy was out late. 
and even so he but even so he stopped outside the angel gate a car went past there was a rustling in the undergrowth suddenly what seemed out of nowhere the professor strode up to him the clip of cowboy boots clacking on the rainbowed tarmac the professor crouched down suppressing a fremlin's belch the boy smelt the hops on his breath and as he whispered as he whispered into the boy's ear and i quote defy the logic of alphabets <clears throat> run with thy swerve embrace the spiral i am clinaman i am chinaman slightly frightened the boy recoiled and the professor tapped to the side of his nose simultaneously the smell of gasoline and a just audible groan issued from the gra from ground level the boy jumped on his bicycle and was off to another time it is said that the professor has a garden of what on earthly delights yet was not above the gurgle and the crack oi he said you are a brave boy to lean your bicycle up against lilith's gate sunny <clears throat> so this project um, is about various things, many, many things. You can imagine you get quite a lot of things in 10 years. Um, but essentially, there are is architectural issues, ideas of history, sculpture, and biological growth, and cobbler linguistic, Joycean and Anjarian dynamics are folded into mythologies ancient and contemporary, worlds that collide with beautiful reflexive sparks that spread light on what it means to be human, creative and alive, artfully confused, naive, receptive to everything, happenstance and synchronistic savagery. So the project gains inspiration from many books, but particularly um, Brother Kalana's 1499 book, The Hypnoeroto Massia Polifero, and its heavenly island of Scytheria. If you put Scytheria into the web, into the net, you get a lady who will let you watch her squirt. So um, I made my excuses and left. My memory theatre is also an island. As we know, no man is an island, merely an nth order cybernetic embrace. Now, in 1966, Salvador Dali made this sculpture entitled Lilith, homage or homage, if, you, if I can lapse into French, um, to Raymond Roussel. It mainly consisted of two angels, I think it's two angels, um, could be one, but I don't think so, pushed together with a cluster of hairpins inserted between them, aping uh, female genitalia. Now, Lilith, according to some mythologies, is the first wife of Adam. If we follow the passage in Genesis 1 to 27 um, closely, and I quote, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female he created them. This is before describing the creation of Eve from Adam's rib. This is read by some to mean that God created a female at the same time as the male. God called her Lilith. But Lilith and her husband started to have what I think you young people call a domestic about the jiggy jiggy. A key medieval text um, entitled The Alphabet of Ben Sura, written between the 8th and 11th century, to be totally accurate. Um, in it, she's quoted as saying, I will not lie below. And he said, I will not lie beneath you, but only on top. She uttered the name of God and went away. God sent three angels after her, but she rebuked them and mated with the demon Samuel. And other demons to create countless Lilin. She is said to be the mother of all succubi and incubi. She appears oddly in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. The white witch would like us to believe that she's human, said Mr. Beaver. And it's on that she bases her claim to be queen. 
But she is no daughter of Eve. She comes from your Adam's first wife. Her they called Lilith. So I also have a gate into my wonderful island of exciting things. Things that will be very useful. And so I will show you the gate. My angel consists of a combination of forms that are meant to symbolise some of the fundamental themes of antiquity and vicariously forms and ideas reinterpreted by the greatest surrealist of them all, Salvador Dali. It also leans very heavily on the work of uh, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, 1598 to 1680. Added to this, it explores notions such as the ethical issues of nanotechnology, growth, digital space, and reflexive new landscapes. It is part, as you will see, of a complex interwoven architecture. The architecture's cybernetic entailment mesh invaginates on itself in a beautiful epistemological push and pull of association, juxtaposition, and substantion. The bush between the wings is made of aerogel. Aerogel is a 90% air, and so it's kind of like cylindrical fog, or cigarette smoke caught in form. So its growth is conditioned by two factors, each reflexively remote. One is the changing number of leaves in a Benini fountain, little fountain, in the Piazza Barberini in Rome. This, um, this fountain. So as autumn comes, the number of leaves increase in the fountain and the bush gets thicker for the winter months. We note, and it will become important later, is that on the fountain of Benini, the papal motifs from the Barberini family, the bee. The project is very much about bees and wasps as well. Now what grows the hair on the bush? What are those vectors made out of aerogel? I um, wanted to, as I'm a middle-aged man going through a middle-aged crisis, um, I wanted it to be very self-referential. It's the narcissism of middle age, perhaps. Um, and I wanted to try and get some sort of genetics of my architecture symbolized right at the beginning of the project. And therefore, I struck upon the idea that I could I've have, had a drawing board, an A1 drawing board, for ever since I studied architecture back in the late 70s, and everything I've drawn has been on that board. So therefore, the genetics of my architecture are somehow encoded in the, in the damage, the palimpsest of the, of the board, and that they should be read by two objects which are tied together like a three-legged race, um, the slam hounds there. So that's what generates. So it senses these cuts and grooves in the board, translates them into a space-time vector, transmits them, and they become part of the aerogel. Bush. In the summer, there's less leaves, and therefore less bush. Now, some of the other influences there are um, Benini's wonderful sculpture, um, Daphne and Apollo, um, in the Borghese Gallery in Rome. This just catches, this is a metamorphic moment. This just catches Apollo as he wraps his hand round in lust of the nymph Daphne, and she changes into a tree. And Benini captures that moment when her hands are just turning into branches and leaves, and her feet are changing into roots. This is a fantastic sculpture. If you haven't seen it, go now. But also, from the Hypnoeroto Massia Polifero, 1499, the metamorphosis, the kind of foresty pate, is an old classical idea. Salvador Dali drew pictures, painted pictures of gala with olive branches. It's a kind of vital metamorphic symbol. 
Also in the uh, Borghese Gallery in, um, in Rome is one of Benini's last works, which was never quite finished. And um, this is called The Truth, Truth Unveiled by Time. Um, it wasn't finished, so it, wasn't, it stayed in the Benini heirs' um, uh, house until 1926. Her fingers between her hands still have the props that uh, they left in when they moved sculptures to their final resting place and then knocked them out. Likewise, the sun also has those supports. And it kind of reminded me of sort of early computer-aided manufacturing things where the computer would work out how to scaffold things while it's building them. So I kind of like that. It's a kind of little nuance there. The thing to remember about truth unveiled by time is this detail. You'll be needing that later. <clears throat> Somewhere there is a little soft machinery, a magic creature like you or me but not like you or me. It grew up out of some stem cells, an old testicle and a leaky bladder. He does things by desire. And little soft machinery lives on the island and under the foot of truth, below the bush pressed between angels' wings. On the island, there is a lot of systems. He plays with them, like the dee stools and the baroness. He makes grease for them and they love him. The professor watches him work, and the weight of truth makes him not contain himself. Little soft machinery is a seed box, a little erector set, self-repairing. He thinks of delightful things. In 1926, this is little soft machinery. Mary Little um, wrote a book called Little Machinery. It was the first time, it was published in New York, it's the first time that um, it's the first time that parts of the Industrial Revolution, if you like, discarded parts of the Industrial Revolution, technological rubbish, was used to construct a child's um, uh, I was going to say toy, but not toy, character. Um, and therefore, it was the first book that kind of got away from the sort of idea of Edwardian fairies and gnomes at the bottom of the garden and all that sort of thing. Another reference uh, which I enjoy is Hieronymus Bosch's sketch here um, from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, which just sort of me, is, it just reminds me of a kind of harbinger of uh, biotechnology. The owl is a is a sim in Boschian symbology is uh, a symbol for the devil. Um, the eyes and the ears in the cops. I think it's kind of vision, a nightmarish evil vision of what biotechnology might turn into, where we use parts of human beings merely as decoration. So there you are, there's little, that was little machinery little soft machinery here. These are some of the pictures of little machinery, 1926. So they're contemporary with um, some of Man Ray's uh, work on cogs and rayograms. Picabia's work not so long before. Here's little machinery helping a vulture sharpen its claw. So these, I think you'll agree, are outstanding. Um, based on the fact that they were created in 1926. The author wrote the story and did the illustrations. Little soft machinery isn't very smart, just smart enough to desire. This provokes his biomechanical glands to produce the grease or the holy gasoline. This substance is called many things. It changes lives. It mixes chance. 
It's a nanotech elixir, smart but highly explosive. The Baroness calls it the holy gasoline and blows it into fiery bubbles out of one of her face tubes, letting off steam as her cast iron lover teeters away, distant but intimately collected. I am driving on holy gasoline. Things ain't what they seem when you are driving on holy gasoline, Zodiac Mind Walk reminds us. Little soft machinery lusts after cars. He is a contemporary Marinetti. As every car passes him by, he revels in their pungent exhaust, fast vibrations and shapes. This, these inputs excite his secreting mechanism and a drop of holy gasoline is produced. Eventually, his bladder becomes so full that it can't resist, resist the weight of the foot of truth and it expels its contents all over the road from where the grease wanders off to the Baroness or to the Alembics. So there we see a picture of little soft machinery, bladder not very well inflated. So this all takes place on an island, an island I grew up living near, um, in a place called Forwich, outside Canterbury, in Kent, in England, in the UK, across the pond. Um, and it's a beautiful island. I think it's the um, UK's smallest inhabited island. And this is where a lot of the action takes place for the project. This is the pub the professor stumbled back from. It's also in a James Bond movie, in Gold, uh, not in the movie, in the book, Goldfinger. Bond stays there one night. The professor ushered us to the water's edge. The misty dawn lifts to reveal six wooden boxes perched on the riverbank above a seldom bubbling silent pond, its surface reflecting the tickle of midges and the sway of lazy branches. The boxes are attached to what look, what look like fishing rods, which curve beautifully with the load of their catch. Each catch is not a fish, but a white alembic. Diana, 17 and nature's queen, you know what I mean, wanders aimlessly around the boxes, finally selecting one. She plonks herself down on one, sitting on the small seat. The boxes' invisible, invisible suspension inductors buzz ecstatically, realigning themselves. The fishing rods tug on the neck of the Alembic, up and down, up and down, up and down. A small globule of grease from the Alembic floats downstream. Beneath her, Diana can hear the whirl of the Klinemann, swaying in its palace of pataphysical machines, desire being swerved into poetry and vicariously into a reflexive landscape. Diana, is a stranger to their sort of mechanical love. One day she prized the lid off one of the boxes. She blinked in disbelief at what she saw. So these are the boxes from the outside. The D trunk is a kind of symbolic response to the fact that Dr. D, Elizabeth's spy, confident of Elizabeth I, used to put all his special books in a trunk and then stuff it up his chimney. Um, he used to talk to angels and demons and scry It's also about the prima materia, the slough of despond, the lowest material which one finds as an alchemist um, to create the metamorphic opus of alchemy. It's around us all the time and yet is highly devalued. I put it to you that for architects, the slough of despond, the prima materia, is space. So we see the grease is the black that drifts downstream and is sensed by a little wire bridge. The boxes, the swimming rods, the alembics in the water, tug, tug, tug. What's inside the box, I hear you cry. This is what's inside the box. A Duchampian door a Duchampian series of draft pistons, a 
Swifty and Gearage, a cucumber, a glass of Lembic, five artificial lips, a ready-made bicycle wheel, some mannequins from um, de Chirico's Disquieting Muses of 1925, various other things. The last one, two other things are quite important. Um, the teeth paver from Raymond Roussel's Locus Solus, and a turd-like object. But fundamentally, the box is about one thing. It's about my prize, the Klinemann, which is this whirling machine on a large sort of angle poise arm. Can you draw a perspective of that, Neil, I hear you cry? Yup. <laughs> so there you see in the foreground the Klinemann with the anemone head and a hole for a face. It's a painting machine. It's based on Alfred Jarry's um, Klinemann. Firstly, I ought to go back and just tell you a little bit about pataphysics. This project is a pataphysical project. Now, pataphysics was conceived by Alfred Jarry as a, um, an affrontery, a poetic affrontery to uh, metaphysics and the idea that there's a kind of holistic theory for everything, which was current in his day. Um, he died in the, in the first years of, uh, of the 20th century. Alfred Jarry was a suicidal drinker. He drank ether, or inhaled ether, I don't know which, and absinthe as a mixture. Imagine what the hangover for that was like. Um, he used to ride around Paris with a gun, firing off shots. He created the poetic affrontery that is pataphysics, which is comma, capital P, pataphysics. Um, and he's known for two major characters. One is Pere Ubu, who um, scandalised Paris by um, the first word of his scatological play, Pere Ubu, um, was Murdra, um, which has many translations, but one of which is shite. So Alfred Jarry, we have to fact, thank for the word shite. Um, there are three declensions of pataphysics. One is anomaly, anomaly. One is hybridization. The other one is Klinemann, the swerve of chance, the choreography of chance. And indeed, in um, Jarry's other well-known character, Dr. Faustrol, um, a doctor of pataphysics, Faustrol comes across a Klinemann, which is a painting machine. And here, the painting machine is my Klinemann. So as the little girl sits on the box, it whirls, paint comes and splashes on si inside the landscape. Now, not just on the kind of geographical topologies, but also on a virtual topology. And this virtual topology slides through the box, and it's kind of like a, a, a planting plan. So it has, instead of plants, it says zones of surrealist poetry. As the paint hits those zones, new surrealist poetry is created from some of the lines or words in those um, things. So there's immediately, one of the other themes about this project is that there's a virtual world, which is invisible, but there nonetheless, and there is an actual world and when they come together, wonderful reflexive sparks happen. So there's the virtual landscape flowing through a poke out the side with a hole in the side, which you'll see later again. So it's all going rather swimmingly at this point, isn't it? Um, it's all stacking up nicely. So, I now want to show you perhaps one of the key pieces to the landscape that, that I'm producing. The Velasquez machine. The Velasquez machine is cited as an input device um, which pairs up with another input device that then relays its um, inputs back to create a vista on the island or a series of vistas on the island. The Velasquez machine is a kind of clasping thing. Inside the clasp, there is a frying pan with some holes drilled in the bottom. On the frying pan are two fish. 
jumping up and down on the two fish are nine inoculating hypodermic kind of me mechanical fleas, which I will show you in a moment. Um, the whole structure vibrates, and it vibrates to the narcissism of artists and architects. As soon as every architect and artist put their work on, the, on a website, then the machine slowly but surely rattles itself to death. Underneath the um, frying pan, as the little inoculating device devices inject hydrochloric acid, the fish decompose, chunks of fish fall onto a very hypersurface, hyper, um, hypersurface, there's a Freudian slit for you, um, tongue. And those impacts become the planting plan of the vista. The other important aspect to see is you'll see there's a plumb line with a um, fried egg. The fried egg, which you can see, as the machine vibrates, creates um, vectors. It's not a real fried egg, because that would be stupid, right? <laughs> and those vectors produce the trajectory of a sculpture that wanders around the vista. So that's in Paris, in the Tuileries Gardens. It's cited in, uh, with Monet's great elliptical paintings. Um, the water lilies. Again, a perturbation, a, a kind of junction between abstract art and um, representational art. These are the little mechanical fleas. You can see the files of um, um, hydrochloric acid there. You can see one in flight there. That's a bit of... Um, graphic malarkey, which I enjoy. That's the first input. The second input is the measuring stick. The measuring stick is in the, within Bramante's Tempietto in Rome, which is part of the Spanish embassy in Rome, a um, little bit of Spain in Rome. Um, and it measures two types of discrepancy. The Tempietto, as you know, 1502, 1505, something like that, was the kind of genesis of the Renaissance, the flowering of the Renaissance in Rome. So there are two different discrepancies that the measuring stick measures. One, the deviance of the classical proportions of the actual constructed um, tempietto. These are small compared to the kind of mathematical exactitude um, that classical architecture can command. And the other one, which are larger discrepancies, Benini, um, sorry, Bramanti, there you are, wanted a courtyard around it, which was also radial. Um, and they built this rather, to use an Alfred Jarry expression, shite one. So that was the kind of plan. Excuse some of the... So it's a, a kind of... Uh, so the temple's in the middle. So there are major discrepancies. Um, these become vectors transmitted back to the island. They become velocities, directions. Made a model. Still not nailed down the model. You know, we're still in that kind of creative space with the, the measuring stick. But there's a few models. Version one. I kind of like that. There's like a little, sit, little bird sitting on its head. Like that. Another one. Artfully smudged, you can now, all these information, eggs, stuff, discrepancies, all come back to the island that I've just shown you and create a vista. But first, every vista has to have a sculpture. And so I wanted to create a sculpture that, again, wandered about a bit. Um, and this is the wheelbarrow with expanding bread. Why would you do that, Neil? Well, I'll tell you. Salvador Dali, inventor of the paranoid critical method, um, had a way of viewing things around him in a kind of psychosexual way. So he looked at Hector Guimar's Paris metro lights and said, ooh, praying mantis, praying mantises, the female, after, after making love, rips the head off the male. Ooh, frightening. Um, I'll, I'll have to do some paintings about it. It's great sort of series of uh, paranoid critical um, Paintings are to do with um, 
Millet's La Angelus, where there's two peasants, head bowed, praying at the Angelus bell, which I think is noon, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, he reinterpreted that in terms of the male covering his erection with his hat. You see, it's an erection covered with a hat there. Um, just about to engage in sort of, let us say, sexual manoeuvres with his, with his mother or wife, we're not sure, in the wheelbarrow position. Hence the wheelbarrow. Now, another Darlinian motif is bread. Bread means kind of stupidity. Did I do that? Um, the light comes on in the dark and is hit by moths. The moths activate the Roux objects, the bouncing mechanical fleas in the, in the Velasquez object, Velasquez machine. Now, here's the vista. It's growing. The dotted line is the trajectory informed by the fried egg of the wheelbarrow with expanding bread. The expanding bread, the moment you look at it, it tries to get 50% of its surface visible to you. Therefore, if two or three people look at it simultaneously, it gets in a bit of a tiz. Behind those, you can see those weird sort of blobby shapes are the bread relative to positions of viewers and times of viewers. And behind the wheelbarrow expanding bread, it's not real bread, obviously, that would be silly, are these kind of blind parallax zones, which are seen fleetingly as different viewers look at it. And I wanted something to occupy those zones so that they could be part of the system and also say something about the kind of creative endeavours of the system. So I hit on the idea of the dance of death. This is Holbein's dance of death and it's basically every picture is pious people going about their business but always at their shoulder is a skeleton saying, you're not long for this world, you may feel all right as it is but basically you're a long time dead so you know, don't fuck up. So I wanted a dance of death character in there. And then I suddenly hit upon it. So in those black zones, projected somehow, don't give a shit how, um, is this object that appears. And of course, it's Pear Ubu. And Pear Ubu is Jarry's wonderful despotic tyrant king of Poland. Um, for which he invented the word shite. This is Dora Maar, it's a 1939 photograph of uh, Pia Ubu. Um, I'll let you wonder about what it is. She was Picasso's mistress at a certain point in time. So this would appear. Composite drawing, a bit of malarkey. So here's a plan of the island. There are various vistas that open up. We've seen how they're made. How do we start vistas? What's the key of where we make the, the initial vista? Well, when the little girl sits on the first box for the very first time, the planting plan disappears and it becomes a plan of the island. And those paint splashes determine the start of the vistas, which are those kind of um, areas there. Then the direction of the vista is carved out according to where certain things happened in my youth, you know, like my first kiss or that very embarrassing moment in the back of a Fiat 126 in 1980. I won't go into the fine points. So it's all going quite well, isn't it? Do you think? So you might, time one, a couple of vistas. I'll explain the other forms in a minute. Time two, time three, etc., etc. Now, at the beginning of the vista, I wanted to have a kind of temple of repose, which is, comes, from, it comes from antiquity, picturesque gardens, somewhere to relax. But of course, mine's not so relaxing. But first, around the Temple of Repose, I wanted a thing. And it's a kind of altarpiece, which revolves around in circles around the Temple of Repose, catching 
metallic objects that are thrown out electromagnetically from the Temple of Repose. These objects, again going back to Dali, are psychoatmospheric objects. Dali said, wouldn't it be great if we got someone in a very dark room, gave them an object to feel, didn't tell them what it was, then photographed it in the dark without a flash, and then cast the camera in lead. And, and then dropped it on a still warm haystack. So I thought, excellent idea. What an excellent idea. So the psychoatmospheric objects are made in the Temple of Repose, which I'll show you. And then they go ping off a haystack and are caught by this baseball glove at the centre and drop through the hole. And they make this kind of Iron Age kind of series of circles. So there's the Temple of Repose. There's the haystack. They're made vertically. What's inside those photos? Well, I don't really know, because you, the point is you don't really know when it's a psychoatmospheric object. But little cameras in all those places where things happen to me take pictures. Sometimes they are in there. Sometimes things are written on the side of these objects, things like maverick deviations, for example. Also, so there you see the psychoatmospheric objects around the circle. I don't know what those funny, holy things are yet. Always has to have some elbow room in the drawing. And up the top there, that kind of funny sort of seat thing is Ubu's seat. Le Corbusier, in the 50s, while he was staying in the States, did some sketches called Ubu forms, informed by Pere Ubu, um, who Jari invented the word shite for. Um, and this is the ribbed Ubu love seat. So, the vista's stacking up well, I think you can say, safely. And there we have the love seat, the temple of repose, the beginning of the vista, the orbiting sculpture. <clears throat> What's at the end of the, of the vista when we get to the kind of coast side, the, the coastline of the island? I was inspired by Renaissance uh, Gdansk, which had streets leading up to the docks, and then at the end of the docks would be a very ornate, beautiful gate. So, I needed a gate. It had to be out of aerogel, um, so I could stick my face through it. So, if you put a small antenna on a bee's forehead and let it buzz about a bit, and track those space-time tra trajectories in a, um, what do you young people call it, a computer, um, you get shapes like this. This is an actual bee's shape. Some of it's been edited. And then you might hand it, or put, put it on itself. And then I might create with it a heavy metal Art Nouveau gate made out of aerogel which I then through the joys of computer-aided manufacture, grow with nanotech and aerogel thing. And it might, at the end of the vistas, look something like that. So, I'm going to show you now the genetic gazebo. It was midsummer, and the rain was fresh on the ground. The smell of nature's verdant new fall, new, newborn organic jewels were in the air, and occasionally the nasty niff of farm effluent wafts across one's sore and streaming nostrils. The boy squares up to the old gazebo. The mill pond and the little weir are on his right and rattling in his ears. He sees a kind of stainless steel um, mixture of a crutch, a monocycle, and a small water meal arching out of a slit beside the window and dipping its head into the unseen water to his right. The boy scrambles up the wall using eroded arises as footholds. 
his little chest heaving with the exertion. He focused an eye through the slit. All was dark inside, but as his eyes grew, grew accustomed to the light, the first thing he noticed was the amber light. A musty smell greeted his nose. This place had a smell of a greenhouse and a church. Strange things happened here, he just knew. He also knew that the spell would bring on an asthma attack. As nature's terrible spores agitated his pink little tubes. Despite feeling this ongoing feeling of tightening in his chest, he edged closer. The silhouettes of two Doric columns stood across the room framed by the outside light. Looking like obscene guardians from another era, protecting an architecture that has long since mutated into a series of electrical pulses, potential differences, and fur machines <coughs> that probed the particular, particularity of all things and fed on itself. F framed between the columns in the bright air outside was a bird bath. The sh silky shine of a freshly watered feather creating a pleasing, quick glint of light. <coughs> He'd had enough. He dropped to the ground, silent against the interference of the weir. He grasped for his inhaler and his coat, dusted the brick dust and water off his gabardine raincoat, and enjoyed instant bronchial relief. <coughs> he noticed the new scratch on the raincoat's cheap plastic buckle. He would return later, perhaps when they said it glowed and when the conkers were out, he limped off. In the 60s and 70s, Gordon Pass, the uh, kind of godfather, of, one of the godfathers of second order cybernetics, created a self wiring ear. Um, and basically, it's a, a series of electrical inputs that are changed and. Um, inserted into a kind of uh, ferrous sulfate solution. And from the electrical pulses, a wiring system evolves. As the pulses change, the wiring either reinforces itself or forms new avenues. This is a dendritic system, um, and the ear was uh, susceptible or could determine, in the end, a few different kind of Hertzian frequencies. This is the kind of array this is how it works. <clears throat> this is mine. It's a 4x4, four four, 16 input grid. Uh, you see the cables coming in. Um, the bird box shaped like a kidney to the right. To the right. The crutch like thing coming out of the window. And in the center is amber. And here is a small dead gerbil who died in 1976 called Mickey. And Mickey was my gerbil. What this project does is it mixes DNA and uses them as inputs to create a dendritic system. So Mickey's DNA, it's a four code, four by four grid, remember, on one side of the array. This is the, uh, a more recent version of the dendritic system. In the amber is trapped a prehistoric insect. Its DNA provides the other coordinates. Those coordinates are mixed by what a, a, a quadripartite bird bath. When a bird baths in one of the quarters of the bird bath, it remixes the kind of uh, inputs. And so you get a system like this. The bits going up are kind of pods of um, aerogel that once their node is stimulated, start to burst out again with these kind of growths, therefore decorating the ceiling of the gazebo. And so, in effect, mimicking Leonardo da Vinci's painting, which is weathered somewhat, of, in the inside of a grotto with tree roots on the ceiling. <coughs> Obviously not all the power, but some of the power 
comes from the other end of the crutch like thing. And that is, on the other end, is the river slapper. The river slapper has a long neoprene tie, as you can see, which flutters in the turbulence of the water, therefore generating a modicum of electricity. This was inspired by looking at a Cezanne after five pints of lager. The creative process, my creative process, doesn't ever, never ever, precludes any way of inspiration. There you see it on site. Now as those pulses in the gen genetic gazebo are working in the um, array, 4x4 four four array, I needed something to define the dimensions of the psychoatmospheric objects. And so those mixed different inputs give different dimensions and therefore cause a kind of anamorphic um, dimension to be re relayed to the next psychoatmospheric object. And here you have a few psychoatmospheric objects waiting to be cooked. They resemble bratwurst and baguettes. The baguette, you'll remember, crucial to my epistemology for this project. Another bit of digital malarkey for you. So, the professor stood before us in a quiet and considered way. He spoke of extraordinary things. He motioned behind him to what looked like a robotic lynching hanging from a strange otherworldly bower. He told us the sad story of Baroness and Pinky, the mutt swine, the shit and hound who lived nearly a hundred Hogmanays ago in the city of collapsing towers. The Baroness blew holy gasoline and even at one point lived next to his non-retinal swiftness. She was known to light her tail with a tail light and smelled and put her tits in tomato cans and wrote of her cast iron lover. She bade us forward, he bade us forward, asking us to be careful. Birds called in the hedgerows. It was such a fine day. We got closer to the Baroness. We admired her cathedral, her feather, her porcupine spine eyelashes, and her circle of woman, and marveled at the U-bend of God. Then, with a far-off gaze, the professor spoke of the glass of, of two halves, one full of chocolate and cemeteries, the other with the cracked and cacked bride. He told us of masculine vibration, and the baleful bachelors. He gathered himself up to his average height, and with all the theatricality he could muster, he said, ladies, gentlemen, actuators and surveillance paraphernalia, including geostats, I give to you, for your predilection, I give to you a vertiginous vortices rock drill, driven to teetering ecstasy by the Baroness's glandular gasoline and her weapons of mass distraction. Now, the Hypno Rotto Massia Polyphero, 1499, Brother Kalana, um, records Polyphero coming across a bower. On the surface of this venerable altar, there arose firm and rigid the rude image of the protector of the gardens with all his decent and proper attributes. Shortly after, we are told, before this image, with great reverence and ancient rural and pastoral ritual, they, the crowd, were breaking a number of glass bottles or flasks, splattering the foaming blood of the sacrificed ass, warm milk and sparkling wine. They made their libations with fruits, flowers, fronds, festivity and gaiety. So, this is the Baroness. Her name was Elsa Freytag von Lorenhoven, 1874-1927. She arrived in New York. She married the Baron von Freytag Lorenhoven, which was a coincidence, wasn't it, really? Shortly after that, went to join the First World War and died. Um, here's another picture of the Baroness relaxing at home. 
you'll notice the canary cage just above the door. She made um, jewellery out of found objects. And we're talking 1917 in New York. This is a kind of hip thingy. This is an earring. This is called Circle, found object. 1917, I hear you cry. She had the studio next to Marcel Duchamp. She fancied Marcel, and she wrote him a poem, which I will quote in full. Marcel, Marcel, I love you like hell, Marcel. Nineteen seventeen. Wasn't that the date of the fountain? Ah, Mutt Duchamp fountain. Ooh. This is God, nineteen seventeen. So the Baroness could have even been first at using kind of uh, sanitary sculpture, found objects. But God, even if it is later, is more blasphemous. God here is reduced to a mixed up knotted pretzel of plumbing. Now, of course, she made others, a little sculpture of Marcel Duchamp evolving from a um, glass of wine. Now, of course, once you've met the Baroness, you've got to have one yourself, haven't you? So I started sketching manfully. That's the second Baroness. This is the Baroness. And there we see various things. Pinky. Robert Hughes writes about the Baroness. Quote, God pales, however, this is talking about the sculpture of God, however, beside the Dada artifact of the Bar Baroness herself, which she became after moving to New York, slender, long-backed, penniless, as mad as a March hare, she survived as an artist model. She would be seen sit visiting the Salon of Water in Louise Arnsberg. The city's first Dada collectors, or stalking through Greenwich Village in black lipstick with postage stamps stuck to her cheeks, her head shaved and stained purple, and dozens of metal toys and lead soldiers sewn into her skirts. She was New York's first punk. People avoided her. People were scared of her, and they rebu rebuked her. She was often arrested. In George Biddle's An American Artist Story, she is described thus. <coughs> With a royal gesture, she swept apart the folds of her scarlet raincoat. She stood before me quite naked, or nearly so. Over the nipples of her breasts were two tin tomato cans, fastened with green string around her neck. Below the tomato cans hung a very small birdcage, and within it, a crestfallen canary. <coughs> in 1917, she also wrote some of her best poetry, The Cast Iron Lover, where she depicts men in the sexual act as defecating toads and draws the analogy of the sexual act as warfare. Bite into mine flesh, and I will bite into thine, she says. So here we have Duchamp's large glass. Here, in this project, the Baroness becomes the bride. The Bower is another aerogel contraction which was uh, made by a Darlinian leg in Figueres, um, Dali's um, museum, theatre museum, which I won't show you for time reasons. 
The bottom half of the scene, the Baroness in her, hanging from a bower, pinky. I needed a, a baleful vibrating bachelor and I picked upon um, Jacob Epstein's rock drill from I think 1913. <coughs> he was so appalled by his own sculpture <coughs> that he only kept the top bit, the torso, and the rest was um, thrown away. Because it was 